It's unstoppable. Next stop, Europe. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Jeff Goetzen. There's something deeply satisfying about eating fruit or vegetables that you've grown for yourself. In this part of Cape Town, you do particularly well to get anything to grow out of the beach sand on which we live. But if you do manage it, well, there's something seriously satisfying about harvesting a vegetable and then eating it fresh at the next meal. As fresh as, as fresh can be. If you haven't planted your winter vegetables yet, you should probably get cracking. Winter veggies include asparagus, but of course no one can grow asparagus, which is why it's so expensive. Uh, beetroot, cauliflower, garlic, mmm, garlic pizza, leeks, onions, parsnips, peas and turnips. Hmm. I wonder, does anyone actually like parsnips and turnips? Hands up if you're one of those strange people that do like parsnips and turnips. Now, perhaps the biggest problem with growing your own veggies is the problem of patience. The whole process is just so slow. You go out each day to have a look and to water and to pull out the weeds and each day nothing seems to have happened. It all advances at a snail's pace, which is really quite misleading because that very same snail can wipe out your entire spinach crop overnight. The rate of vegetable growth makes a snail look like a Formula One driver. It takes weeks and months before you before you get your veggies. Today we begin a new series in the book of Acts. It's the year of mission and mercy and so we have to we have a series from Acts because Acts is a book all about mission. It's incidentally also a book about mercy. We won't get to it in this series but on his third missionary trip Paul collects a great big bag of money for the poor in Jerusalem because you can't separate mission and mercy. Acts is a book about the unstoppable mission advance of the kingdom of God in our world. But when we look around us, well, we just don't see it. To us, the advance of the kingdom of God is frustratingly slow, like the, like the growth of vegetables. It's hidden and it's mysterious. At times, to us, the kingdom of God even seems to be going in reverse. Most of the churches of Western Europe are empty and the only thing that seems to be advancing at, at any speed in our world is, well, is secularism. We feel the rapid crush of atheism and worldliness threatening to overpower us. And because it's all so slow, we're tempted to think that God has forgotten us. That he's forgotten his world and that we'll soon be overrun by it all. And so it's important that we're reminded that the kingdom of God is actually advancing. Today, right now, even here. I, I hope you'll be encouraged and perhaps even motivated by this series to look around you and to see the kingdom of God advancing. And then I hope that you'll even be motivated to work for the advance of the kingdom, even though it all seems slow and hidden. The kingdom of God is advancing, even though at times the snails and the moles seem to be eating the vegetables. The victory's certain. It is unstoppable. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is like yeast. Once it gets into the dough, you just can't stop it. Our series is a small one and Acts is a large book. We're just studying a small portion of it. What we're going to do over the next six weeks is we're going to follow the Apostle Paul on his second missionary trip, which is important because it is the Gospel's arrival in Europe. Paul's first missionary journey was to Asia Minor. He has a little map. We call that Turkey today. The red is the Roman Empire and Paul went firstly to Cyprus then to Perga in Pamphylia, to Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. They're all in Asia Minor, all in Turkey. In each town where Paul preaches, he gets clobbered for his efforts. In Lystra, Paul gets stoned to the point that the people think that he's dead. Now imagine Kelly and Ivor and Kathy, who are off on a mission trip in the next few weeks, coming back and reporting back that on their mission trip, they got stoned. As Paul is wrapping up his presentation, he says, you know what, I think I'm going again. Anyone want to come? I don't know about you, but I'd need a sabbatical after being stoned almost to death and certainly some counseling and some special TLC. But Paul is unfazed. He's going again and now in his second journey, he aims a little further west. I've got another map. He aims for Greece. 
which is to say he aims for Europe. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let me remind you firstly of the story so far. It all starts in Jerusalem where Jesus rose. Kapow! Let's never go, grow tired of that fact. And with that, the disciples start to dream. They start to dream that, that maybe it's now. It's going to happen now. Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel now. In Acts 1 verse 6, they ask him, are you now going to restore the kingdom? You see, they're dreaming of gold in the streets and prosperity and victory, and who can blame them? Jesus has risen. They're dreaming of Eden. The fulfillment of the promises of God, death being conquered, conquered blessing and land and fortune. They're the dreaming of breakthrough and victory. They're dreaming of heaven. But to their disappointment and ours, Jesus says that's not how it's going to be. Instead, he says, I'm going to give you power. But it's not power for victory. It's powerful mission. Here's Acts 1, verse 8. Jesus speaking, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. We remember his ascension this Thursday. It's his coronation. He returns to his Father from where he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now that sentence in Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, provides the skeleton for the book of Acts. So in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 2, we read of the Holy Spirit being given to the Jews at Pentecost. That is the, the Judea bit. We, we, we know these events quite well. We, we naturally read ourselves into the story, expecting Holy Spirit baptism, tongues of fire, and to speak in tongues ourselves. But that event is not about most of us, because most of us are not Jews. That was the Holy Spirit being given to the Jews. It was God including the Jews into his new kingdom. Then as we read on in Acts 8, the Holy Spirit is given a second time. This time he's given to the Samaritans, those from Samaria, those hated half-Jews. Samaritans are Jews who had intermarried with Assyrians and others. They, they were regarded as the scum of the earth, the remnants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And in Acts 8, even they're included into the kingdom of God. And, and then it happens a third time in Acts 10. The Holy Spirit is given to the Gentiles. Now, now you see it's about us. It's easy to forget how big a thing that was. The Jews hated the Gentiles. The Gentiles hated the Jews. Not much has changed, of course. The Gentiles were excluded, separated outsiders. We weren't a part of the people of God. In Acts 10, Peter's given a vision by God. A, a great sheet descends with all sorts of animals on it. Peter, who's hungry, is told to kill and eat. On the sheet were pigs and ostriches and lobster. Peter protests, I've never eaten an unclean animal. Next moment... Some servants arrive, sent by Cornelius the Gentile. They ring the doorbell. Ding dong. They ask to see Peter. An angel has told Cornelius to send for Peter. Peter goes to Cornelius' house. He tells them about Jesus dead and Jesus raised. They believe. And the next moment, the Holy Spirit comes on those Gentiles. Who believe? It's brilliant news. Even the Gentiles are included. Even you and I can be included if you believe. So come on. Trust and believe. Don't delay. Don't wait until tomorrow. Trust Christ now. The shape of the book of Acts comes from Acts 1 verse 8. It's the kingdom of God advancing to the Jews in Judea, to the Samaritans in Samaria, and then to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. But there's another possible way to divide the book of Acts, and that's by dividing it into its two main characters. In chapter 1 to 12, the main character is Peter, but then he's never mentioned again. And from chapter 13 onwards, the main character is Paul. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and it is to Paul that we turn in our series. Well, let me tell you about Russell Cook. Here he is. Got a picture for us. His Instagram is Hardest Geezer. Now, Russell recently successfully ran the full length of Africa. It took him 352 days to run from Cape Agulhas to Tunisia. 
The 27-year-old from Sussex said he, was, he struggled all his life with mental issues, uh, gambling and drinking, and he wanted to make a change. And so he decided to run the length of Africa in order to raise money. He ran at least a marathon every day for more than a year. And on some days, he even ran an ultramarathon across 16 countries in order to raise money for charity. He managed to raise in excess of 700,000 pounds for charity on his 15,000 kilometer journey. Now we're going to focus on Paul's secondary, second missionary journey. It wasn't quite as long as Russell Cook's. It was only about, well, about 5,000 kilometers. But just think about that for a moment. It's still a staggering effort to walk 5,000 kilometers. Paul travels on foot and some on ship to Europe so that Europe may know Jesus. Here's the journey that we're going to study. It took two and a half to three years of walking and sailing. He walked the length of Turkey. That's somewhere between 1,000 and 1,600 kilometers. He crossed over to, G to Greece, arriving in Philippi. Then he went on to Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and Corinth. Now, those are great tourist destinations to us today. But remember that Athens was the birthplace of Western civilization. This was the capital of Greece. This was the thought center of the world. This was the city that gave us democracy. It was the city of Plato and Aristotle. 260 kilometers from Athens was the site of the ancient Olympic Games, which were happening at this very time. And so Paul is journeying into the very heart of ancient civilization. We pick up the story today in Acts chapter 15, where the first council of the church has just met in Jerusalem. The problem that they gather to discuss is a, is a problem that's still with us today. It's this. If you're a Christian, must you keep the Old Testament law? Must you keep the Saturday Sabbath? Must you keep the dietary laws? Must you stone those in same-sex relationships? And must you circumcise your boy children? They resolve, that council, that Christians don't need to circumcise and don't need to keep Old Testament law. If this is an unresolved question for you, then watch the video on YouTube that I've made answering this very question. It's called, What does a Christian do with Old Testament law? The Jerusalem Council meet, and they resolve that Christians are free. And they then send Paul and Barnabas off to Antioch to tell them what they've decided. When trouble starts to brew. Let me read. Let me read from Acts chapter 15, verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we've proclaimed the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him, sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening, strengthening the churches. It's a tiny little story. It doesn't seem particularly significant. But it does show us that mission is messy. The Bible doesn't present a sanitized version. Paul and Barnabas agree to go on mission, and then they disagree about taking John Mark with them. And this is the same John Mark who wrote down Mark's gospel. The text says that Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement, which is to say, they squabble, they fight, and perhaps there are even angry words. So severe is the disagreement that they agree to go their separate ways. Sometimes people join churches and they're disappointed when there's conflict. We sometimes think that there'll be no conflict in the family of God, that the church will be like heaven on earth. And then what happens is someone irritates us, or tells lies about someone, or, so, or says something that makes, makes their blood boil. Someone does something unkind or thoughtless, and what happens is we get grumpy. The problem is, of course, our, actually our expectations. We expect the church that's full of broken, sinful people, to not somehow be broken and sinful, huh? We wonder why the pastor's not perfect, and why he's not all-knowing, and, and why the people are sinful, and how dare they be? But God's not defeated by Paul and Barnabas' squabble. 
On the contrary, God uses their brokenness for his glory. God's kingdom is not defeated. On the contrary, the kingdom is actually advanced. Because now what happens is two mission parties get sent out. And we also know that later Paul and Barnabas and, and John Mark are reconciled. And it's in reconciliation where the church is truly different. We have squabbles. But we don't hold on to them. We don't harden our hearts to people who have hurt us or irritated us. Sometimes conflict needs some time for the heat to die down, for the anger to subside. And when it does, then Christians actively seek reconciliation. Because we're brothers and sisters for eternity. Is there anyone you need to be reconciled with today? I know of at least two people in my life. There are probably more. I've tried with these two people and I've failed. They've rebuffed me. The ball is now in their court. But for me, the challenge is my heart. When God brings them to repentance, will my heart still be open to them? If you cause the conflict, are you seeking to cause the reconciliation? If you've offended someone publicly, do you need to apologize publicly? Well, two mission parties are sent off. Barnabas and John Mark head off to Cyprus. Paul and Silas head to Derby and Lystra. Pardon? Derby and Lystra? It's been two or three years, but Lystra is where the Iconians stoned Paul until they thought he was dead. Are you going back to Lystra if that happened to you? That would take real guts and the conquering of very real fears. As he walked on the road, Paul must have wondered, will they recognize me? Will they do it to me again? Am I going to my death? But Lystra was also the place where Paul had done a great miracle, healing a paraplegic. So remarkable was that miracle that the crowd thought Paul and Barnabas were gods. They thought that they were Zeus or or Hermes. Acts 16, verse 1 says, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance observance, the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. And so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers. Well, enter Timothy. Enter Timothy into the story of the kingdom of God for the very first time. It's a few years since Paul was last in Lystra, and somewhere along the way, Timothy and his mother Eunice have been converted. Because the kingdom of God is advancing. Perhaps they saw what happened to Paul on his last visit. They've not seen the risen Jesus, but they've listened, and they've believed the witness of the little group of believers in that town. Eunice was Jewish, but Timothy's father was a Greek and an unbeliever, and so Timothy's not been circumcised. Eunice had taught his son about Jesus. Timothy is to become Paul's son, not in a biological way, but in a discipleship way. Paul will build on Eunice's work. He'll teach Timothy everything he knows. Timothy will be his spiritual son, and Timothy will take over responsibility for the church in Ephesus after Paul has been imprisoned. Paul wants Tim to come with him on his journey. And so he circumcises Timothy. Pardon? Now remember that the reason that Paul has come to Lystra and Derby is to share with them the message from the Jerusalem council that Christians don't need to be circumcised. In his first meeting with the church, Paul would have stood up and said, Hey guys, it's good to be back. The council had met in Jerusalem and it was decided by all the top dogs that you don't have to be circumcised to be a Christian. Uh, those guys that are saying you can only be a Christian if you keep all the Old Testament law, well, they're wrong. They are dead wrong. And then, in the family news part of the service, Paul would have said, hey guys, uh, we're having a circumcision party for Timothy this Saturday, and you're invited. We're left thinking, huh? In the book of Galatians, Paul preaches as strongly as he possibly can that you don't need to be circumcised. But then he circumcises Timothy. Paul, are you a flick flacker? Paul, are you like our politicians that say different things to different audiences? 
poor? Are you a hypocrite? It's not that. Instead, what Paul is doing is modeling how Christian ethics works. Christian ethics are always a both and, not an either or. Paul establishes the principle that you don't have to be circumcised to be a Christian. And what a relief that is. But in order not to be a stumbling block to others, he circumcises Timothy. You see, Christians are to be strong in truth and strong in love. We tend to get one of the two right and the other wrong. We are either strong in truth or we're strong in love. But we need to be strong in both. If you're strong on truth and not strong on love, then you become angry and a crusader. If you're strong on love but weak on truth, then you become wishy-washy. But when you know the truth, then you have great liberty. And knowing the truth enables you not to trample the consciences of those who are weaker than you. Instead, it allows you to really love them. Let me pick just one area of application for us in this regard. Let's take sexuality. Let's take the LGBTQI plus question. Christians stand firm on the biblical truth that God has made men and women for heterosexual relationships. We stand firm on that. But we also stand firm on the principle that we will not be haters. We will love and care and serve and protect and perhaps even die for those that disagree with us. Because that's what love is. We'll embrace them and seek to love them because we'll be strong on both truth and love. Homophobia is never okay. It's a failure to love. And we've been set free to love. Compromise is also never okay. Because we know the truth. And we declare it to the world. And the net result is Acts 16 verse 5. The churches were strengthened in the faith. And they increased in number. As I close. Just a reminder of our applications today. Take action to fix any relationship that you need to fix. And be a Christian that stands firm on both truth and love. Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, you are the creator and rescuer of all humanity. We humbly implore you for all people everywhere. That you would make your ways known to them. Your saving power to all nations. You've called your church to witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself. Empower us, we pray, so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may be drawn to you through him who was lifted up on the cross and now reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.